Need motivation? Watch Top 10 with Believe Nation. Top 10, top 10 I got a top 10. Top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10. Top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more, and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Elon Musk, and my take on his top 50 rules for success. 2008 in particular was, 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 was awful because um, we had the third launch failure in a row of, of our Falcon 1 vehicle at SpaceX. Um, and um, we, uh, the Tesla financing round that we were raising fell apart because um, the economy was going to tailspin. Um, and it's pretty hard to raise money for a startup car company, uh, you know, late 2008 when GM and Chrysler are obviously going bankrupt. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, was, that was tough. And then Solar City had to deal with uh, Morgan Stanley, and Morgan Stanley had to renege on the deal because they themselves were running out of money. Um, so it looked like all three companies were going to die. Mm -hmm. And I was also going through a divorce. So that was definitely a low point. <laughs> so it's 2008, you're going through a divorce, which like some, to borrow your word, douchebag bloggers are writing about to make even worse. Right, uh, yes, that's true. Um, in addition to, <sighs> to all that stuff happening, I was getting dumped on massively in the press. Right. Yeah. You're, you know, it looks like all three companies <laughs> yeah. are going to fail. I mean, why do you keep going with all three? Like, I feel like even a lot of great entrepreneurs right. in that situation would have been like, I've already sunk everything I have in these companies, and I got to pick one. But you didn't. I mean, you kept doing all three. Why? Um, yeah, that was a, that was a very tough call. Um, at, at the end of two thousand eight, that was that was probably the tough, you know, one of the toughest calls I've had to make, um, because I could either um, reserve capital for one company or the other. I mean, fortunately, Solar City didn't need a ton of capital, so they were they were okay. Um, but between SpaceX and, and, and Tesla, um, you know, it's sort of like, like if you've got two kids and mm -hmm. what do you do? Do you spend all your money to, to, to maximize the probability of success of, of one or do you, do you try to keep both alive? Fortunately, mm -hmm. it worked. It's very important to, to seek out, uh, to actively seek out um, and listen very carefully to negative feedback. Um, and this is something that people tend to avoid because mm -hmm. it's, it's painful. painful yeah. um, but but the, I think this is a very common mistake, is to, to not actively seek out and listen to uh, negative feedback. Where do you do that? Do you go into forums? Um, do you go into Twitter? Like, what, what are your uh, areas where you go to look for feedback on, let's say, the Tesla? Well, it's like every, everyone I talk to is, um, in fact, when, um, when friends get a product, I say, look, I d don't tell me what you like, tell me what you don't like. Right. Um, and, and because otherwise your friend is not going to tell you what he doesn't like. Right. This guy's going to say, oh, I love this and that, and, and, and then and leave out the, this is the stuff I don't like list. Mm -hmm. Because he wants to be your friend, want, you know, it doesn't want to offend you. So, um, so you really need to, 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 to sort of coax negative feedback. Um, and you, should, and you know that if somebody is your, is your friend, or at least not your enemy, and they're giving you negative feedback, um, then they may be wrong, but it's coming from a good place. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes even your enemies give you good negative feedback. When I started the first uh, internet company, Zip2, um, uh, with my brother and, a, and another person, um, yeah, Greg Curry, the, uh, it wasn't really with the thought of being wealthy. It, it, you know, I've got nothing against being wealthy, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll get back to that later too. <laughs> but but it's just it it was just from the standpoint of been wanting to be part of the, the internet and uh, I, I I figured if we could make enough money to just get by it would be that would be okay. Um, and when we when we started off uh, we 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 literally only had like one computer and so it would be our web server during the day and I'd code at night um, and we we just got a a, a small office um, uh, in, in Palo Alto back when rent was not insane. Um, and uh, it, it cost us like $450 a month. It was cheaper than an apartment, so we actually just slept in the office and then, sh and then showered at the YMCA at Page Mill El Camino. So we'd walk over there and, and, and shower. And, uh, and that was, um, actually I think, 
Yeah. That was when I, f we first, I first met you, by the way. Sure. Um, and uh, so I don't know if how many people, no, probably not many people know this, but uh, uh, we actually pitched uh, Steve in like January 96 on uh, the, the Zip2 business plan. Uh, and actually, I thought um, Steve was actually one of the most up to speed on, on, on what actually was in our business plan. Most, most of the people <laughs> we met did not actually read our business plan. Um, in fact, a lot of people, we, a lot of venture capitalists we met at the time didn't even know what the internet was. Or, or they've never used, they've never used it. Sure, they didn't think I'm not sure if we anything. still do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm talking like, you know, sort of well-known people on Sand Hill. It was like, wow, okay. Um, but, but at the time, nobody had made any, any money on the internet. So I guess uh, that's, um, you know, it, then it wasn't really clear evidence that, that there was, was a business. I should say that, you know, when I was a kid, I, I didn't really have any grand designs. I mean, the, the reason I started com programming computers is because I like computer games. Um, and I play lots of computer games. And um, I, I learned that if I wrote software and sold it, then I could get more money and buy better computers. So it wasn't really, you know, with some grand vision or anything. Um, when I was growing up, I'd, I'd read lots of books, and uh, they were very often set in the United States, and it seemed like a lot of new technology was being developed in the United States, so I, I thought, okay, I really want to work on new technology, so I want to get to Silicon Valley. Um, you know, which, at, w uh, when I was growing up, at Silicon Valley seemed like some sort of mythical place, uh, you know, like Mount Olympus or something. <laughs> Also, if you want to have more self-confidence and self-belief, I've designed a special free training to help you do it. The science says it can take up to 254 days of consecutive action to build a new habit. And, and I want that for you. I want you to build the habit of self-belief. So what I'm going to do is email you every day for 254 days a link to an unlisted video that will shift your belief forward to get on it for free. The link to join is in the description below. There are just times when something is important enough, you believe in it enough, that you, you do it in spite of the fear. If you have a great product, lots of people will buy it. <laughs> and then the company will be successful. That ended up being worse than if we had designed a car from, from the beginning. I think one thing that's important is, uh, if, if you have a choice of a lower valuation uh, with, with someone you really like, or a higher valuation with someone you have a question mark about, take the lower valuation. Um, it's, it's better to have a, a higher quality, uh, venture capitalist who you think is like, would be great to work with, than to um, ha you know get a get a higher valuation with someone where there's even a question mark really. You know I think that's that's important. It's sort of like getting married. You know I don't know. Is the secret to your success to be the CEO of two companies at the same time? No. <laughs> I think it's... Because uh, look at the correlation. Yeah. Struggling companies, everything's in the craft can in December 2008, so let's take on a new CEO gig. And, yeah. And same for Steve, coming back to Apple. Uh, right? No, it de definitely it was not my intention to be CEO of two companies. Um, the, uh, I mean, I, after, I mean the, the, I, I, there are certain things that I, I kind of wanted to, I thought it were important to happen, and I thought it was important that, um, that, that there was, that, that, that an electric vehicle happened, that there was a, a success in the electric vehicle arena. Uh, because the, the the incumbent companies were convinced that it was not possible to create a, an electric car that looked good, had range, a good range performance, and so forth, um, and that even if you did make such a car, it would not sell, uh, because people had uh, this love of gasoline, um, and uh, so we had to show that it was possible to create a compelling electric car, long range, good looking, you know, all, all those things. That, that was a Tesla Roadster. And if you created, if, if if you made such a thing, people would buy it. I certainly was uh, quite. Um, I was very very bookish. I was reading all the time. So I was either reading, uh, working on my computer, reading comics, playing Dungeons and Dragons, uh, that kind of thing. And um, um, I understand Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, that wonderful book by Douglas Adams. That was yeah. a that was a key book for you. What what was it about that book that that fired your imagination? Um, yeah. So. Uh, I guess when I was in the, around 12 or 13, I had kind of an existential crisis, and I was reading various books um, on trying to figure out the meaning of life, and well, like what does it all mean, because uh, it, it, it sort of seemed quite meaningless, and then um, uh, my, we happened to have like some, some books by Nietzsche and Schopenhauer in the house, which you should not read at age 14. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> it's really negative. Um, 
So, so, uh, but but then I then I read uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is like quite positive, I think, and um, uh, and it sort of highlighted the, the the an important point, which is that a lot of times the question is harder than the answer, and if you can properly phrase the question, then the answer is the easy part. Nice. Um, and so, uh, the if to the degree that we can um, better uh, understand the universe, then we know, better know what questions to ask, and. Um, then whatever the question is that most approx approximates what's the meaning of life, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's, that's the question we could ultimately get closer to understanding. Um, and so I thought, well, to the degree that we can expand the scope and scale of consciousness and, you know, and knowledge, um, human knowledge, then that would be a good thing. Well, we've got a lot of work to do uh, because we've got um, a lot of service centers and charge stations to construct. Um, so mostly it's like we're trying to build our service and charge infrastructure as fast as possible. Um, and uh, I know this, like s some of the customers who have ordered a car, they're not in the major cities, so they're a little unhappy with us because we are delaying delivery of their car. Um, and uh, in fact, I'm gonna apologize to some of them personally to exp and explain the reason we are delaying delivery is because it's, we really want them to have a good experience. But if they're too far from a service center and, and the charging is not sorted out, then they will not have a good experience. Um, so we're going to delay the cars just for a few months to make sure that they have a good experience. I think it's also important to reason from first principles rather than by analogy. So the normal way that we conduct our lives is we, 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 we reason by analogy. Um, it's, we're doing this because it's like something else that was done, mm -hmm. or it's like what um, other people are doing. Me too but, type ideas. Yeah, it's slight, well, it's, yeah, slight iterations take, yeah. on, on, on a theme. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and, and it's, it, cause it's, it's, it's kind of mentally easier to reason by analogy rather than from first principles. But by first principles is kind of a physics way of looking at the world. And what that really means is you kind of boil things down to the most fundamental truths and, and say, okay, what are we sure is true or, or as sure as possible is true? And then reason up from there. Mm -hmm. uh, that takes a lot more mental energy. Um, Give me an example of that. Like what's one thing that you've, you've done that on that you feel has worked for you? Sure, so um, somebody could say, um, in fact people do, uh, that battery packs are really expensive and that's just the way they'll always be because that's the way they've been in the past. Um, you're like, well, no, that's, that's pretty dumb, you know, because if, if, uh, if you applied that reasoning to anything new, that ha then you, you wouldn't be able to, to ever get to that new thing. Right. Some of us noticed that the stereo goes to 11 right. on, the, on yeah. the Tesla. This is a spinal tap exactly. reference for those who know that this, this one goes to 11 and you need just, just one more. It's louder right? than loud. That's right. Exactly. That's right. But no one seems to have noticed the product lineup. So you got the Model S. You got the Model X. Oh, yeah. You've just trademarked the Model E. Yeah. No one's met anything. What do you, yeah. You gotta, the, and the model, you gotta add and some. the Model Y. Yeah. Now, what's behind this? <laughs> I know, exactly. Well, there's not, I guess there's not a lot of humor in trademark, uh, the trademark law, you know? Because, <laughs> um, yeah, obviously we just trademarked sexy. Um, so, uh, and, and, and then we're having this, this discussion with the, like Ford, because um, they, um, the Ford's council, uh, uh, they also didn't get it, like, because they're, they're sort of slightly opposing us using Model E. Mm. Um, and then they saw that we registered Model Y, and they said, oh, you're planning to use Model Y instead of Model E. Like, no, it was just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> like, we don't do that. <laughs> like, what does it spell? Come on. When trying different things, you've you, you got to have some acceptance of failure, uh, as you were alluding to earlier. Failure must be an option. If failure is not an option, it's going to result in extremely conservative choices, and you, you may not you may get something even worse than lack of innovation. Things may go backwards. Um, so, um, if what you really want is uh, risk, risk to, 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 you, want, you want reward and punishment to be, to be proportionate to the actions that you seek. So, if uh, if, if what you're seeking is innovation, then you should reward success and innovation, um, and only 
there, there should be minor consequences for lack of minor consequences for for trying and failing. There, there should be minor um, with significant rewards for trying and succeeding. Minor consequences for trying and not succeeding, um, and big and, and, and major negative consequences for not trying. Or maybe I just blank out the word doubt. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so uh, no, I mean, I, to be totally frank, I doubted us too. So I, I thought we, uh, you know, had maybe when starting SpaceX, maybe had a ten percent chance of reaching orbit. So. So, you know, to those who, who doubted us, I was like, well, I think you're probably right, you know? Um, I mean, the number of times uh, that I, I was told, like, because uh, you know, I was taking the money that I earned from, from PayPal and, and rolling it into to create SpaceX and Tesla and, and, and I was, ended up spending it all. It wasn't the intention, but, um, and, and, and uh, almost both companies went bankrupt, frankly. 2008 was a tough year. Um, you know, it took us, took us uh, four attempts just to get to orbit with Falcon 1. Um, and uh, so, but a lot of times I was, you know, I, I, people would tell me this joke, like, how do you make a small fortune in the rocket industry? You start with a large one is the punchline. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I already heard that joke 12,000 times, you know? <laughs> so so um, anyway, um, and it, was, it, it almost came true. Um, you know, we, we just barely made it there, that fourth launch of Falcon 1. That's all the money we had for that fourth launch. And then, uh, it, and that wasn't even enough to, to save the company. We also then had to win the NASA cargo resupply contract. Um, so that, that came a little after, you know, a little, little bit later, or right towards the end of 2008. Um, those are the two key, key things that, that saved SpaceX. Otherwise, we would have, we would have, you know, not made it, so. Um, so yeah, I think those those doubters were their probability assessment was correct, um, but fortunately, uh, fate has smiled upon us and brought us to this day. As you look back on your career in the space industry, what has been the most surprising or unexpected challenge that you faced? And along those lines, if you were to go back in time and talk to your 20-year-old self, would you do anything differently? Go back in time to your 20-year-old self. I mean, I think I'd. If I get, it, I think it would make a lot, far fewer mistakes. Obviously, if I could go, like, here's a list of all the dumb things you're about to do. Please do not do them. <laughs> Wouldn't we yeah, all? It'd be a very long list. And like, you know, here, let me you know, write it down or something. You know, um, I mean, it's hindsight's twenty twenty, so it's hard to say. Um, I mean, a number of I've made so many foolish mistakes. I have lost count, honestly. Um, I mean, some of these things I just wish I, like, the, the, like that's some sort of mantra, management by rhyming. I mean, it, it worked for Homer, okay? Um, but management by rhyming is, the, that thing I was saying, like, if the, if the schedule's long, the design is wrong. We've overcomplicated the design many times. Um, and I think we should have just gone with a, a simpler design, um, with the acid test being, how long will it take to f for this to fly? And if it's going to take a long time, don't do it. Do something else. I think we we need to push for radical breakthroughs. Um, and if you don't push for radical breakthroughs, you're not going to get radical out outcomes. Um, and that that does mean taking risks. Um, and, and yeah, common sense that the, the, if you take a big risk, in order to have, have a big reward, there must be a big risk. It's, most of the time, you cannot find big reward for small risk. That's what those are rare. Um, so you're going to have some proportionality of the risk and reward. Really just is it, is it, simplify your product as much as possible. Um, You know, and, and then like, if, if I think of some of the ways in which, how does a smart engineer make dumb mistakes, include, you know, is optimize something that shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. Don't optimize something that shouldn't exist. 
Um, but people are trained to do this in college. You can't say no to the professor. You know, the professor's gonna give you the, the exam and you've gotta answer all the questions or they will get angry. Um, so, and give you a bad grade. So then you, you always optimize the, you always answer the question. A lot of the times you say this is the wrong question. Mm -hmm. Right. In fact, the question is definitely wrong to some degree, just how wrong. Um, and I think just generally taking the approach that your design is some degree wrong, probably a lot more than you think, your goal is to make it less wrong over time. One of the fun things for me is watching the, the, the cargo go into the crew vessel. You know, all of a sudden we had Dragon 1, now we have Crew Dragon, and it's, it's substantially different but, but familiar. Mm -hmm. So tell us, like, what's been some of the hardest parts to transition from cargo into crew? Because crew is a little more important than, <laughs> than cargo. Yes. I mean, cargo can be replaced, crew cannot. Um, right. And so the, the level of scrutiny, the level of attention is... I mean, I don't know, order of magnitude greater. I mean, it, was, it, was, it was already high for cargo. I mean, we're, and, and, uh, but it's, it's just a whole other level for, for crew. Um, so, you know, after, and after I told the, the, the SpaceX team that, you know, the, uh, m this mission reliability is not merely the top priority, it is the only priority right now. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just doing continuous uh, engineering reviews uh, from now, nonstop, uh, 24 hours a day until launch. Just yeah. going over everything again and again wow. and again, and I was out at the pad just recently, just walking down the rocket. Um, we, we've you know we've got a team that's just crawling over the rocket in the horizontal. Then we're going to rotate it vertical. Then we're going to crawl all over in the vertical, and um, we're just looking for any any possible action that can improve the probability of success, no matter how small, whether that comes from an intern or me or anyone. Right. Doesn't matter. What sort of things do you look for in people or in processes that make the workforce better? Sure. Well, I think the massive thing that can be done is to make sure your incentive structure is such that uh, innovation is rewarded and lack of innovation is punished. So you've got to be a carrot and a stick. So uh, if somebody is innovating um, and doing, ma making good, good progress, then they should be promoted sooner. Um, and if somebody is completely failing to innovate, um, not, not every role requires innovation, but uh, if they're in a role where innovation is, should be happening and it's not happening, then they should either not be promoted or exited. And let me tell you, you'll get, promote, you'll get, you'll, you'll, you'll get innovation real fast. So now your actual total mass of a steel, uh, of a reusable steel spacecraft is less than that of the most advanced carbon fiber vehicle you could possibly imagine. Yeah, wow. But this is, happened by accident, by the way. This may sound like some great insight, but it actually happened because we were moving too slowly on composite, um, and I was like, we cannot move this slowly or we'll go bankrupt. So right. just get, do this with steel. So, you ha I mean, the design has to be focused on problem solving, otherwise you're going to spend too much time trying to figure, you, you don't start with a, yeah. Yeah, I'm like uh, sort of taking to management, management by rhyming. If the schedule is, schedule is long, your design is wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is a very true. That's a good, good point. Yes. Zip2 started off um, as basically, uh, like I said, we're trying to figure out how to, how to make enough money to exist as a company. and. The, so, so since there wasn't really any advertising money being made, uh, we thought we could um, help existing companies get online, bring their stuff online. So we, we developed software that helped bring a um, lot of the newspapers and media companies online because a lot of them just didn't, they also didn't know what the internet was. You had or, some big customers, didn't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even the ones that were aware of the internet didn't have a software team, so they, could, they weren't very good at developing functionality. Um, and uh, so we had, as um, investors and customers, uh, the New York Times company, Knight Ritter, Hearst, mm -hmm. and, and so we were able to get them to pay us to develop software for them to bring them online, so online publishing stuff. And we did maps and directions and yellow pages and white pages and uh, various other things. Uh, I met a woman I, I dated briefly in, in college um, who now works at Scientific American as a writer, and, uh, and, and she, she related the anecdote that uh, we went on a date I was, all I was talking about was electric cars. 
Um, <laughs> that was not a, big, a winning conversation. <laughs> so it was a bit of a monologue, was it? Yeah, she said, uh, she, she said the first question I asked her was, do you ever think about electric cars? <laughs> said, no, she so never does. <laughs> so, so you learn from that, that wasn't the best yeah, shout-out line. Yeah, wasn't, it wasn't great. But, great. Uh, it has, uh, recently, it's been more effective. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I know yeah. this man. Yeah. First of all, you don't need college to learn, it, learn stuff, okay? Everything is available basically for free. Uh, you can learn anything you want for free. It is not a question of learning. Um, there, there is a value that colleges have, which is like, you know, seeing whether somebody's, is, can somebody work hard at something, including a bunch of sort of annoying homework assignments, and still do their homework assignments? Uh, and, and kind of soldier through and, and, and get it done. You know, that's, that's like the, the main value of college. And then also, you, you know, if you, you, if you probably want to hang around with a bunch of people your own age for a while instead of going right into the workforce. Um, so I think colleges are basically for fun and to prove you can do your chores, but they're not for learning. The real way I think you, you actually achieve intellectual property protection is by innovating fast enough. If your rate of innovation is high, then you don't need to worry about protecting the IP um, because other companies will be copying something that you did years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and that's fine, you know. Um, just make sure your, your rate of innovation is fast. Um, speed is really, speed of innovation is, is, what, is what matters. Um, and I do, I do say this to my teams like uh, uh, quite a lot, that innovation per unit time, as I go, innovation per year, if you want to say it, like, is, is what matters, not innovation absent time. Because if you wanted to make, say, 100% um, improvement in something, and that took 100 years or one year, that's radically different. So um, it's like, what, what is your rate of innovation that, that, that matters? And is the rate of innovation, um, is that accelerating or decelerating? Um, and a weird thing happens when companies get big is that most companies um, or organizations, the bigger they get, they tend to get less innovative. Um, not just less innovative on a per person basis, but less innovative in the absolute. Um, and I think this is probably because the incentive structure is not, uh, is not there for innovation. Um, it, it's not enough to use words to encourage innovation. The incentive structure must be aligned with that. That's fundamental. You need to work, if you, if, depending on how well you want to do, and particularly if you're starting a company, you need to work super hard. So what, what does super hard mean? Um, well, when my brother and I were starting our first company, uh, in, instead of getting an apartment, we just rented a, a small office and we slept on the couch. Uh, and we, we showered at the, the YMCA and uh, we're, we're so hot up, we had just one computer, so the, the, the website was up during the day, uh, and I was coding at night. Seven days a week, all the time. Um, and I, I uh, sort of briefly had a girlfriend in that period, and in order to be with me, she had to sleep in the office. So, uh, work hard, like, it, it, I mean, every waking hour, that's, that's the, the thing I would, I would say, if, if you, particularly if you're starting a company. Um, and, I mean, if you do simple math, say like, okay, if somebody else is working 50 hours and you're working 100, uh, you'll get twice as, done, as much done in the course of a year as the, as, uh, the other company. I came to the conclusion that um, my initial premise was, was wrong, uh, that, in fact, the, um, th there's, there's a great deal of will. Uh, you know, the, the, there, there's, there's not such a shortage. Um, but people don't think there's a way. Um, and, and that if people thought there was, there was a way, or at least something that wouldn't you know, break the federal budget, um, then, the, then people would, would support it. Um, which in retrospect I think is actually kind of obvious because um, the, the United States is a distillation of the human spirit of exploration. Mm -hmm. uh, people came here from other places. Um, I mean, it's, you know, there, there's no nation, there's no, I mean, there's no nation that, that's more a nation of explorers than the United, the United States. But, but people need to believe that it's possible and it's, that it's not 
you know, it's, they, don't have, they don't have to give up like healthcare or something important. <laughs> right. you know, it's just, it's got to be that 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 that's important. So, so I thought, okay, well, then it's not a question of will. It's it's a question of showing that there's a way. Well, in, in the beginning, nobody wanted a Tesla. I can tell you that. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the the when we made the original sort of roadster sports car, uh, people were like, well, why would I want an electric car? That's my gasoline car works fine. I'm um, like, no, electric car is better, I should try it. Um, and it was hard, you know, hard to get people to do a test drive. First of all, nobody knew who we were, they never heard of this company. And I'm like, yeah, we're named after Nikola Tesla, you know that guy? Nope. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, for sure we were doing push in the beginning, because people said, there was no one telling us that they wanted an electric car. So it was not, it was not out of like, you know, it was like lots of people coming up to me saying, hey, I really want an electric car. I, did, I heard that zero times. Um, <laughs> so people were like, it's like, man, we're going to make an electric car and show that these things can be good. Um, and then people want them. Um, you know, it's like, I think it was like Henry Ford said, that, like the, you know, if you, when we talk about the Model T, it's like if you ask the public what they wanted, they'd say a, fa a faster horse. Mm -hmm. and so if, if, you, if you did like a big survey and said, well, hey, public, before automobiles, what would you like? It's like, well, I'd like my horse to go three miles an hour faster and eat less food and, uh, you know, be stronger and live longer and that kind of thing. Um, there will be basically a, a bunch of incremental improvements on horse. Because um, people, when you say like, well, what about an automobile, that car that drives itself? I'm like, what are you talking about? That's, that's not, that sounds crazy. Um, but when you actually make an, an automobile and give it to people and say, okay, now this is a horse where you can keep it in the barn and if you leave for a month, it's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so carry more, more weight than a horse and go further and that kind of thing. So, anyway, the, it's like when, when it's a radically new product, people don't know that they want it because it's just not in their, in their, in their scope. I think when they first started making TVs, they did a nationwide survey. I think this might have been like 46 or 48. It was like a famous nationwide survey. Will you ever buy a TV? And it was like 96% of respondents said no. Hmm. Some, some crazy number. Like basically everyone's like, would you buy a TV? And maybe they put a price in there or something. I don't know. But it was famously, almost everyone said they would not buy a TV. But they didn't know what they're talking about. So, so the big game-changing stuff at the beginning is a company push kind of a thing most of the time. But yeah. then changes to the product over time can be a lot more customer pull kind of a focus. Yeah, ch changes to the product over time can be uh, incremental changes. Um, then, then, then customers can certainly tell you, it's good to get customer feedback to say, how can we improve the product? Um, and once they're using it, they can say, okay, I like this thing about it, I don't like this other thing, and then we can improve the product over time. Customer okay. feedback after they, they have the fundamental thing is, is great. I think failure is bad. Um, I don't think it's good. Um, mm -hmm. But if, if, if something's important enough, then you, you do it even though the risk of failure is high. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think my advice if somebody is in, wants to start a company is, they should bear in mind that the most likely outcome is, is that it's not going to work. And they should reconcile themselves to that pos strong possibility. Um, and they should only do it if they feel that they, they're, they are really compelled to do it. You know? right. um, because it's, it's, it's gonna, the, the way starting a company works is like, usually in the beginning, it's the very beginning, it's kind of fun. Um, and then it's really hellish for, for a number of years. You talked about chewing glass. Yeah, there's, there's a, fr a friend of mine who's a successful entrepreneur um, and uh, started actually his career around the same time as I did. And he, he has a good, good, good phrase, his name's Bully. Uh, um, he said, yeah, you're starting a company is like eating glass and staring into the abyss. Um, and, and you agree with that? Generally true, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, 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 and if you don't eat the glass, you're not going to be successful. Well, we have a lot of good, good people at SpaceX that you know, um, 
a lot of really talented people. Uh, in fact, I wonder like sometimes how we can make use of their talents in the best way because you know I think we're often not using their talents in the best way. Um, Yeah, but I, you know, to the point of the question I was just asked, I want to make sure Tesla recruiting does not have anything that says requires university because that's absurd. Uh, but there is a requirement of evidence of exceptional ability. Like you just can't, if you're trying to do something exceptional, they must have evidence of exceptional ability. I don't consider going to college evidence of exceptional ability. In fact, ideally you dropped out and did something. I mean, obviously, you know, we look at like, you know, Gates is a pretty smart guy, he dropped out. Uh, Jobs is pretty smart, he dropped out. You know, Larry Ellison, smart guy, he dropped out. I'm like, obviously not needed. So, Did Shakespeare even go to college? Uh, probably not. I, mean. I think of the, these things as just, there's a certain amount of time, and within that time, you want the, the, the best net outcome. So for you know, all the set of actions that you can do, there's going to be uh, and some of which will fail, some of which will succeed, and you want the, 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 the net useful output of your set of actions to be the highest. Um, so, um, I mean, to, like use like a, a baseball analogy, like, you know, baseball, they don't let you just sit there and wait for the per perfect pitch mm -hmm. until you get a real easy one. They didn't give you three shots. And the third one, they say, okay, and they get off the, and they go back to the, put somebody else up there. Um, so you have three strikes on, on the baseball, um, not, you know, not on bat anymore. So, so what, you're, what you're really looking for is like, what's the batting average? You know how how you doing on uh, on score, um, and and just there's going to be some amount of failure, um, but you you want your net output, um, net useful output to be maximized. Failure is essentially irrelevant unless it is catastrophic. Don't just follow the trend. So um, you may have heard me say it to, to, that it's good to think in terms of. The, the physics approach of first principles, uh, which is rather than reasoning by analogy, you boil things down to the most fundamental truths you can imagine and you reason up from there. And this is a good way to figure out if, if, if something really makes sense or if it's just what everybody else is doing. Um, it, it, it's hard to think that way. You can't think, think that way about everything. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, but if you're trying to do something new, it's the best way to think. Um, and that framework was developed by, by physicists to figure out counterintuitive things um, like quantum mechanics. So it's really a powerful, powerful method. I believe in the scientific method and one should, be, one should have a healthy skepticism of things in general and you know, as, if, if you approach things from a scientific standpoint, you always look at things probabilistically, not definitively. And so I think a lot, a lot of times, if, if somebody's a skeptic in the science community, what they're really saying is that they're not sure that it's 100% certain that, right. that this is the case. But that's, that's, that's not the point. The point is um, that is, 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 is to look at it from the other side. So what, what do you think the percentage chance is of, of this being catastrophic for some meaningful percentage of the Earth's population? Um, is it greater than 1%? Is it even 1%? Um, if it is even 1%, why are we running this experiment? You hire, you look for innovative people when you hire them. Is, is it something that, that is, is pretty easable, easily learnable, or, or is there some innate quality in the people that uh, succeed? I think it is learnable. I mean, step number one would be try. <laughs> and and it, it, have you tried? And if you, if, have you tried hard? And if you haven't tried hard, try hard. It, it, I think it is learnable. Um, it's not some mysterious thing. It's just basically just be like an absolute perfectionist about the product that you make, the service that's provided. Um, seek negative feedback from all quarters. Uh, you know, 
from customers, from, from people who aren't customers, like, hey, okay, what do you, what can we make this, how can we make this better? Um, and, you know, I think that's, it, it's absolutely learnable. And, 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 and just, if you find yourself spending a lot of time in get, get, getting presentations and reviewing spreadsheets, you're barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> The, that, that's the that, that's the effect of the cause. Um, so, just get out there on the factory floor, get out there in the stores, talk to customers, think about what what would what would you love to have. Oh, and, and you know, sometimes I think, you know, and I've had this conversation at, at Tesla a few times, where it's like we're trying to think. Okay, we don't it's at, at times like we don't love this product, but we think others will love it. Uh, you know, that's not really how it works. If you don't love it. Don't expect others will either. You think about a company, a company is, is a group of people that are organized to create a product or service. That's, uh, that's what a company is. So in order to um, create such a thing, you have to convince others to join you in, in your effort. Um, and, and, and so they have to be convinced that, that, that it's a sensible thing, that, uh, it's like, that there's at least some, some, good, some reasonable chance of success. Uh, and if, if there is success, that the reward will be commensurate with the effort involved, um, and uh, you know. So, so I think that's getting people to to believe in what you're doing uh, and in in you is is, is important. Um, so, in in the beginning, there will be there will be a few people who who do, who believe in you or in, in what you're doing, um, and uh, but then over time, as you make progress. That the evidence will build, and and more and more people will believe in, in what you're doing. So, um, I think it's a good idea when creating a company to um, to create it, to have a demonstration, or you know, to, if, if it's a product, to have like a a, a good mock-up, or if it, even if it's, if it's software, to have good demo wear, or to be able to sketch something so people can really envision what it's about. Um, like that, that's a, try to get to that point as soon as possible, and then. Iterate to make it as as real as possible, as fast as possible. If you're going to try something innovative, then then you're in unexplored territories. So the odds that something will go wrong are, are pretty high. Uh, if you know, it's only if you try to do something that is already well understood that um, there's little little chance of failure. Um, yeah. But then it will not be uh, interesting or innovative. Um, so you know, for sure, uncharted territory will result in um, failures. Uh, Necessarily, otherwise you're not trying hard enough. Did you surround yourself with mentors? How did you? Who did you look to for advice? I, I read a lot of books and talked to lots of people. Um, I didn't have any any one person who was a mentor, uh, but I I always look for feedback from from people around me and feedback from uh, an historical context, uh, you know, which is books basically. And so you want to have a, a competitive situation where it's truly competitive. Uh, where companies aren't gaming the system, um, and uh, and then where the rules are set correctly, um, and and then you need to be on the alert for regulatory capture, where the the referees are in fact captured by the players, um, which is you know and and the the players should not control the referees. You're running. You're CEO of two companies. You're chairman of Solar City. Talk about time management. How on earth do you do this? Well, do you get any sleep? Uh, so, yeah, sometimes not enough. Sleep is is really great, because uh, because if you, I find if I don't get enough sleep, then I'm I'm quite grumpy. Um, I mean, obviously, I think most people are that way. Um, <laughs> and 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 also, um, like I try to sort of figure out what's the right amount of sleep, because I I found I could have, I could drop below a certain threshold of sleep, and although I'd be awake more hours and I could sustain it, I would get less done because. Um, my, my, mental acuity would be affected. Um, so I found generally the right number for me is around six to six and a half hours on average per night. Um, That's not too bad. Yeah. Right. And any other tips that is on... That's an average, though. <laughs> right. Any other tips on, on just managing to run two companies simultaneously? I mean, do you, do you find... I mean, I know you're up here <clears throat> Monday, Tuesday. Is it all Tesla when you're up in Silicon Valley and all SpaceX well, Wednesday, Thursday? It, 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 uh, having a... Sort of a, a, um, having a smartphone is incredibly helpful because that means you can do email during 
um, interstitial periods, like if you're in a car, you're walking in the bathroom everywhere, you, know, you can do email practically when you're awake. Um, and uh, and so, so that's really helpful to have email for SpaceX and, and Tesla integrated on, on my phone. Um, and then, uh, and, and then it's just you have to apply a lot of hours to actual working, actually working. So the, the way I generally do it is I'll be uh, working at SpaceX on Monday and then Monday night fly to the Bay Area, uh, spend Tuesday and Wednesday in the Bay Area, then at, at Tesla, and then fly back on Wednesday night, spend Thursday and Friday at SpaceX. Um, in, in, in the last several months, then I, I would fly back here on a Saturday um, and either spend Saturday and Sunday at Tesla uh, or spend Saturday at Tesla and Sunday at SpaceX. Generally, you want to embark on something, it's desirable yeah. to figure out if success is, is at least one of the possibilities. Right, exactly. Because <laughs> for sure failure is one of the possibilities. Yes. Um, but, but ideally you want to try to bracket it and say success is in the envelope of outcomes. Yeah. Um, and uh, I wasn't quite sure if that was the case. Um, I mean, I think success on an academic level would have been quite likely because you, you can publish some useless paper and uh, most papers are pretty useless. Um, you know. We have a few, don't take offense. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, we have, we have the, how many PhD papers are actually used yeah. by someone ever? Um, I mean, no, that's a good point. percentage wise, it's not, no. it's not good. No. Uh, and um, so, so it, it could have been one of those outcomes where uh, you add some leaves to the tree of knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and that leaf is, nope, it's not possible. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, right. <laughs> <laughs> there goes seven years of mine. Um, <laughs> So that was, so that was one, one path, and I was prepared to do that. But then the internet was the internet came along, and I was like, okay, the, the internet. I'm pretty sure success is one of the possible outcomes, and it seemed like I could either do a, do sort of do a PhD and watch the internet happen, or I could participate and help build it in some fashion. You know, put a, you know, help, like I just couldn't stand the idea of, of watching it happen. Yeah, yeah. So that that's uh, so I decided to put things on hold uh, and start an internet company. And that, that was kind of a, we, we worked on internet, uh, like publishing software, yeah. maps and directions, yellow pages kind of things. First of all, when we interview people, we, we do ask for some evidence of, of exceptional ability, which in most cases in, includes uh, innovation. Uh, this is not to say that everyone needs to be innovative, it's, but we certainly need those that are doing advanced engineering to be innovative. Um, and ideally everyone is at least some, to some degree innovative. Uh, so at the interview point, we select for, for people who, who want to create new technology, and then the incentive structure is set up that, such that uh, innovation is rewarded. Um, making mistakes uh, along the way does not come with a big penalty. Um, and, but, but, but failure to try to innovate Mm. at all comes with a big penalty. You'll be fired. Okay. Yeah. All right. The carrot and the stick. Yes. That's the stick. If you don't even try, um, or, or somebody doesn't even try to innovate, or their innovation um, aspirations are, are, very, are, are not, not, not very good, then, yeah, they will no longer be at the company. I don't have a mentor per se, although I try to, I try to get feedback from as many people as possible. Um, and um, so I have, I have like friends, and I ask them to you know what they think of this, that, that, and the other thing. And um, you know, uh, as mentioned, you know, Larry's a good, Larry Page is a good friend of mine. Value his advice a lot, um, and um, I have many other good friends. And uh, so, so I think it's good to solicit feedback, uh, and particularly negative feedback, actually, because you know, obviously, people aren't, don't love the idea of giving you negative feedback, um, unless, unless it's like some. You know, on, on, on uh, blogs, they, they do that. 
We're gonna look at some memes, right? Yes. And say things that are, say funny things about them. Well, I think we rate them. Oh, we rate them. Okay, that's it's a right. review and then- We're reviewing and then- Out of 10. Of course, okay. I mean, there's some good memes here. Is this the first one? I believe so. Okay, yeah. Uh, a spoon is just a small bowl on a stick used to eat from a larger bowl. He's earnestly presenting and, this in Congress. And you can see, you can see how, how, how easy it would be to just replace that text and yes. add anything you want there. It's almost as though he wasn't saying that. So it's, yeah, I, I rate this uh, out of, what, what's the scale, one to 10? Yeah. Is it one to 10? Oh, uh, I, I have five, I guess. Yeah, six maybe. Maybe a six. Yeah. It's, this it's, particular... It's like a mid-range, it's a mid-range meme. Yeah, it, I don't think this one's got legs. Also, it's kind of tipping into the political area, which is like, yeah. I don't know, who needs it? You know what would be funny? The, the, the get off my lawn. <laughs> that would just be... get off my lawn. Would, that be would be great. <laughs> that would be really good. Get off, get my, off lawn. my lawn. Would, would... Okay, yeah. That, that, okay, I'll okay. I'll bump it up a, yeah, yeah. another number because that's a good. Uh, so I give it a six. Get off my lawn. Madagascar and gas car. <laughs> oh, I see. So you love you love Madagascar because it's just a, such a heartwarming, f wonderful film. But then Gas Car, you're like, what? I've actually never seen this movie. So. Have you never seen no, Madagascar? No, no, no. It's no. There's a lot of lemurs. I refuse to watch any movie with the word Gas Car in it. <laughs> uh, it's not bad. Uh, it's sick. But no, but really. I don't think I'll make you. Everything is six. How, how do you? <laughs> how, but 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 how do you feel about? Is, uh, is that trippy? To, like for real? It's a meme of with you in it. Are you sort of like, what the hell? Yeah. Or have you gotten over that and you're just like, eh? eh well, I mean. This past uh, couple years have been, particularly last year, it was Meme City. Meme City. Yeah, Meme City. Uh, Man, that'd so be interesting. I've seen a lot city. of memes. Okay, now this is this is a, a, a proper quandary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A proper okay, quandary. Okay. Would you step on Stuart Little for eighteen billion dollars? Uh, uh, <laughs> I love how poorly photoshopped. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's like it's like they just er they got a gray color and just erased whatever the hell it's like and just put him in. Yeah, you kid. The only sentient mouse, or is it sentient or sentient? Uh, sentient. Sentient. Is it sentient? I think sentient. Sen I've always said sentient. No, I've said sentient. 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 Sentient or sentient. <laughs> okay, what is this? Stop sending me this shit. <laughs> Wait, that, <laughs> that's not that's not post at all. Who is that guy? That's me. That's oh me. Oh my that's god, me. is that a weird combination of you and post? <laughs> yes. And this is a real this is a is this a real tweet? No. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Man, dude. Nothing you can't that's believe good, anything. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I'm face mashed with uh, post alone. That's a funny meme. That's a funny one. You could apply it not only to you, but to other celebrities yes, and yes. people. So yeah, I, I think that's a funny meme. I'm I, into I, that. I give it a because it could be it could be just like a dumb drawing. It could be any. It could, yeah. it could be so many wonderful things. I give us. I say eight. 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 Yeah, eight. eight. It's a solid yeah. eight. Whoa. Whoa. This is. This, this is, is like, so meta. Me laughing at the idea of me laughing at me. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I had a lot of friends of mine try to talk me out of starting a rocket company because they thought it was crazy and. It worked. <laughs> A friend of mine made me watch a video of rockets blowing up. <laughs> uh, and, you know, there were just lots of people that thought it was a really crazy idea. And there were some people that had tried to start rocket companies, not succeeded. And they, they tried to talk me out of it. And, um, but the thing is that the, the premise for talking me out of it was, well, we think you're going to lose the money that you invest. I was like, well, um, that was my expectation anyway. Right. So I don't really mind if I lose, you know, I mean, I don't mind, but I mean, it's, it's not. It's not like I was trying to figure out the rank ordered best way to invest money, right. and on that basis, um, you know, chose space. Right. It's not like that's. <laughs> you know, I thought, wow. You weren't looking at like huge... money, money market bonds, AAA bonds, right, exactly. rocket companies. Like you weren't like do real yeah, estate. Yeah, yeah, yeah real, could, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, uh, invest in shoemaking, anything. <laughs> um, and whoa, space is, is <laughs> highest ROI. Yeah, uh, exactly. that's, that is not what I. That is yeah. not, not, it wasn't the premise. Um, I just thought that it was important that uh, humanity expand beyond Earth, and we weren't doing that, so maybe there was something I could do to kind of spur, spur that on. Well, I was just saying that, you, that you, know, you want to take a moment to appreciate things in life and the sensations. Um, you know, food's incredible. Uh, and uh, like, there's just so many good things that you can experience. Some of them cost nothing, really. Um, you know, have a walk in nature or uh, just a nice meal, and it's like, wow, that's pretty great, you know? And uh, we should take a moment to appreciate these, these uh, little things, the big things, um, the things that move your heart. I think 
that's probably the meaning of life, as close a definition as, as I can think. You want to have like a good competitive forcing function so that uh, you have to make the product better uh, or or you'll lose. Like if you don't make the product better and, and, and improve the product for the end consumer, then, then that company should have relatively less prosperity compared to a company that makes better products. Um, now, now the car industry, you know, is, is actually pretty competitive, mm -hmm. uh, so that's good. Um, and uh, and, and so then the, th but the the good thing about a competitive comp industry is then if if you make a, a product that's better, it's going to do better in the marketplace. How much of your success do you attribute to having really audacious goals, or versus um, just not being focused on the short term, you know, money coming in or and our investors. Unfortunately, I, I, one, and one does have to be focused on the short term and money coming in when creating a company, because otherwise the company will, will die. So the, the, I think that a lot of times people think like creating a company is going to be fun. I would say it's not. It's really not that fun. I mean, there are periods of fun, and there are, there are periods of where it's where it's just awful. Um, and particularly if you're the CEO of the company. Um, you actually have a distillation of all the worst problems in the company. Um, there's no point in spending your time on things that are going right. So you only spend on things on your time on things that are going wrong. And, and there are things that are going wrong that other people can't, can't take care of. So you have like the worst. You have a filter for the crappest problem in the company. <laughs> the most pernicious and painful problem. Um, so I wouldn't say it's... it's it, I think you have to feel quite compelled to do it. Um, and have a, a fairly high pain threshold. And there's a friend of mine who, who says like starting a company is like staring into the abyss and, and eating glass. Um, and there's some truth to that. Um, the staring into the abyss part is that you're going to be constantly facing the, the um, extermination of the company. Because uh, most, most startups fail. Uh, it's like 90%, arguably 99% of, of startups fail. So. Uh, so so you, you, that, that's the staring into the abyss part. You're constantly saying, okay, this, if, if, if I don't get this right, the company will die. Um, it should be quite stressful. Quite stressful. And, and then um, the eating glass part is you've got, you've, got to do, you've got to do the problems. You've got, to, you've got to work on the problems that the company needs you to work on, not the problems you want to work on. And, and so that, the, that's, you end up working on problems that, that uh, you'd really wish you weren't working on. And so that's, that's the eating glass part. Um, and that goes on for a long time. Running a public company does, is, does have its drawbacks. Um, so you're not in a hurry? No. <laughs> okay. um, I mean, in the case of Tesla and SpaceX, um, we, we had to raise capital, um, and, and we had kind of a complex equity structure that needed to be resolved by by going public, um, and um, and so so I thought we, we kind of needed to do that in those two cases. We don't have to do that in SpaceX. I think, I think there's a good chance we will at some point in the future. But but SpaceX's objectives are, are super long term, and and the market is is not. So I'm a bit worried that if we did go public, certainly if we went public too soon, that it the, the, that market pressure would would force us to do. Uh, short-term things and abandon right. kind of long-term projects. Like uh, going to Mars. Right, going to Mars, very long-term. When I was in, in high school, I thought I'd most likely be doing physics at a particle accelerator. <laughs> so that's what I was, um, in physics and computer, I mean, I got distinctions in two areas, in physics and computer science, and those were, those were yeah, some of my two best subjects. And, uh, and then I thought, okay, well, that, I want, I want to figure out what's the nature of the universe, and um, so, you know, go try to work on, with people, banging particles together, and see what happens. Um, and um, and then it, it sort of things went along, and the, the superconducting super collider got cancelled in the U.S. And that actually was like, whoa, you know, what if I am working at a collider? It's been all these years, and then the government just cancels it. Wow. And then that would I was like, I'm not going to do that. So. Um, so it's like, so my, 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 well, we roll, roll back a little. Um, like, I was, I was trying to figure out what, when I was a kid, I had like this existential crisis, and I was about 12 years old or something. And, 
And I was like, well, what does the world mean? What's it all about? Are we living some meaningless existence? Mm. And, and then um, I, made, I made the mistake of reading Nietzsche and Schopenhauer, and, <laughs> and, and I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> don't do that. Not a, not a, to not uh, need to be a little older, I think. No, no, and actually, lately, these days, I sort of reread it. So I was like, you know, it's actually not that bad. Uh, wait, he's, he's got issues, he's got issues, no question about it. But, but you know, it's, anyway. Um, so, uh, but then I read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Douglas Adams, uh, which, was, which was like quite a, really quite a good book on philosophy, I think. And uh, I was like, okay, we don't really know what the answer is, obviously. Uh, so, but the universe, the universe is the answer. And that really, what are the questions we should be asking to better understand the nature of the universe? And so then to the degree that we expand the scope and scale of consciousness, um, then we'll better be able to answer the, ask the questions um, and understand the, why we're here or what, what it's all about. Mm-hmm. And so we should sort of take the set of actions that are most likely to result in us understanding what questions to ask about the nature of the universe. Oh, I always thought we would fail, so this is uh, all, it's all upside. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I thought maybe we had a 10% chance of reaching orbit starting out. So then uh, you know, people thought uh, when we started SpaceX, they said, oh, you're going to fail. Uh, so I agree. I think we probably will fail. Yeah. But it's worth trying anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How's that for honesty, huh? Yeah. They this, this, this said I'd lose all, all, like, you know, lose all the money from PayPal. I was like, well, you're probably right. You know, and we almost did. We had the first three launches of Falcon One didn't work, and the fourth one we scraped together some parts, and and that one worked. And if that one hadn't worked, it would, be, would have been that would have been it for us. So, um, I don't know. I really believe in the future of space, and and I think it's important that we become a space faring civilization, and and I'll be out there among the stars. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, makes people excited about the future. And it, you know, we want the things that are in science fiction novels and movies not to be science fiction forever we want them to be real one day if you think like what is education like you're basically downloading data and algorithms into your brain and it's 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 actually amazingly bad in conventional education because like it shouldn't be like this huge chore um uh, so you're making it way way better um but i mean i think i think i think a lot of the things that i would say you've probably heard a hundred times um and, and our effect are, if, if not doing, like the more you can gamify the, uh, the process of learning, the better. Like I, for my kids, I do not have to encourage them to play video games. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have to like pry them from their hands, yeah. like, like yeah. crack. Yes, yeah. yes. Like drop that crack needle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have that problem at your house too, <laughs> yeah, yes. Exactly. The, the crack is addictive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, so it's... Yeah. You know, it's it's it, to the degree that you can make uh, somehow learning like a game, th- yeah. that then yeah. it's it's better. Um, and I think, unfortunately, like a lot of education is very bored um, yeah. That you, you've got uh, you know someone standing up there, kind of lecturing at people, uh, and they've done the same lecture twenty years in a row, and they're not very excited about it. And that lack of enthusiasm, you know, is conveyed to the students that they're not very excited about it. They don't know why they're there. Yeah. Like, why are we learning this stuff? We don't even yeah. know why. Um, in fact, I think a lot of things people learn are probably there's no point in, in learning them because um, they, they, they never use them in, uh, in the future. Because um, who's going to launch a rocket into space? I mean, that's just like, yeah, yeah exactly. That never happens. <laughs> yeah. um, well, you have to say, like, people, I think, don't stand back and say, well, why are, are we teaching people these things? And we should tell them probably why we're teaching yeah. these things. Because a lot of kids are just in, in school kind of puzzled as to why yeah. they're there. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think if you can explain the why of things, then that makes a huge difference to people's motivation. Yeah. Then they understand, they understand purpose. Yeah. Um, so I think that's pretty important. And thinking about the, the various problems that we're facing, or, or what would most likely change the future, um, the, when they were in college, there were sort of five things that I thought would be... Um, I mean, I thought these were actually... These, 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 I would not regard this as a profound insight, but rather an obvious one. Uh, the you know, the internet would fundamentally change humanity because it's it's like uh, humanity would become more of a super organism because the internet is like the nervous like a nervous system. Mm-hmm. Um, now suddenly any part of the human 
human, human organisms anywhere where you have access to all the information Amazing. instantly. So, Zero link. Hey, well, I like, can imagine if you, if you didn't have a nervous system, you wouldn't know what's going on. Your fingers wouldn't know what's going on. Your toes wouldn't know what's going on. It, it, you'd have to do it by diffusion. Um, and uh, yeah, and the way information used to work was really by diffusion. One human would have to call another human, or, 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 or write there. them. <laughs> yes, like if it was a, in a letter, <laughs> you would have to write a letter. You'd have to hand that letter to another human. That would be carried through a bunch of things. Find another person would give it to you. Diffusion. Extremely slow diffusion. Um, and if you wanted access to books, if you were not did not have a library, you were not, you don't have it. That's it. Right. So. Um, now you have access to all the books instantly. Um, and you, you, if you can be in a remote, like, you know, mountaintop jungle location or something and have access to all of humanity's information if you've got a link to the internet. This is a fundamental, profound change. Let me just tell the yeah. story and okay. then you can correct it. Because right. the story is great and I, <laughs> I mean, hope it's Yeah, true. let's see if the story that so, you tell is actually, how, does that, how that compares to the, the we'll reality. Because the reality is pretty uh, messed up. So, <laughs> hopefully the reality is better. So you wreck the car, you get out of the car, you're doubling over with laughter. And the <laughs> really? person with you said, why are you laughing that you just wrecked this car? And you said, no, you don't know the funny part. It wasn't insured. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the punchline's correct. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was actually, I was driving up uh, Sand Hill Road mm -hmm. um, with, with Peter Thiel, one of the co-founders of PayPal, we were actually driving to see Mike Moritz. Mm -hmm. um, this is in, in uh, 2000. And uh, so we're driving up Sand Hill Road. I didn't really know how to drive the McLaren. And uh, Peter says, so, so what can this do? <laughs> <laughs> and then like, I'm probably number one on the list of famous last words. I said, watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, I, so I floored it. I floored it and did a lane change um, on, on Sand Hill. And so the, the McLaren has no uh, traction control or anything. It was just, it's massive power to, to the wheels. So 600, 640 like brake horsepower and it, it only weighs a, a ton. So it has massive power to weight. It can break the wheels free at 80 miles an hour. Um, so broke the rear, the rear end free and, and started spinning. Um, and uh, I, 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 I sort of, uh, let's see, I think it was sort of, I was, I was going straight and then turned, um, and, and I remember seeing the, 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 the cars coming towards me while I was going backwards. And then we hit, the, hit an embankment, um, sort of a 45 degree embankment on Sand Hill, which tossed the car into the air like a discus. And it kept, ro it kept rotating with about three foot of air, air clearance, according to witnesses. Um, <laughs> and, and, and then slammed down on, on, on the ground, going the original direction. Um, and, and we blew the suspension out, uh, and uh, now it didn't actually wreck the car. The core chassis and the engine were okay. Thank uh, God. But, but all, all the glass and the, the wheels and everything was, sh was shredded, and, um, and th there was massive body damage in the front and rear. Um, and um, yeah. Uh, and did you start laughing? Um, I don't recall laughing. Um, I, I mean, <laughs> I. <laughs> I, I could have been laughing in shock, uh, <laughs> but I don't recall laughing. Um, and, um, and, then, and then Peter uh, caught a, hitched a ride to, to Mike. I, I, I waited while the, the fire truck and the ambulance did arrived, and then finally the... Did Peter Thiel literally hitch a ride? To, to, like, to yeah, over to, to, to Sequoia to, yeah. And then, and then I, I, once, once the car was uh, taken care of, then I, I, I hitched a ride too. <laughs> um, and so and we, 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 we continued the meeting. That's, I'm picturing you and Peter Thiel, like that scene in Tommy Boy, where yeah. like the deer, and you're both like, ah, and like. Yeah, really. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah. Is there a parallel? Lucky to be alive, really. <laughs> I, I should say so. Yeah. Is there a parallel with how you build companies in that story? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see yeah, what this be, thing can do. <laughs> uh, yeah, watch this. Um, that, that could be awkward with a rocket launch. Um. <laughs> now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. When you just get inspired, you watch a video, you get motivated, amazing. 
the science says you have a 35% chance of actually doing something, actually following through. That, Believe Nation, is not enough. That is not you, not now, not anymore, not today. But when you get inspired and then you create a specific plan of action for what you're gonna do, that number jumps to 91% chance of you following through. And when you commit publicly to others, like leaving a comment in this video, it jumps to 95%. So the question of the day is your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week, put it down in the comments below and maybe next week I'll profile you. What drives you? What, what is it that when you wake up in the morning, do you see a problem and you want to solve it? Yeah. Uh, I think the, the thing that uh, drives me is that uh, I want to be able to think about the future and uh, you know, feel good about that. Um, so uh, that uh, you know, we're doing what we can to uh, have the future be, be as good as possible, um, to be inspired by what is likely to happen, um, and to look forward to the next day. Um, so. That's that's what really what really drives me is 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 trying to figure out uh, how do we how to make sure that things are great and um, and going to be so and um, that's the underlying principle behind uh, Tesla and SpaceX um, is that um, I think it's 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 pretty important that we accelerate the transition to uh, sustainable generation and consumption of energy. Um, it, it's inevitable, but it's, it matters if, we ha if it happens sooner or, or later. Um, and then SpaceX is about um, helping make life multiplanetary um, and doing what we can to continue the, the dream of Apollo um, and uh, ultimately make a contribution to life becoming multiplanetary. It started out, I actually had one of the very very first Twitter accounts, like when it was like less than 10,000 uh, people. And, I th and, and then everyone was tweeting at me like what kind of latte they had at Starbucks. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, well, this seems like the silliest thing ever. So I deleted my Twitter account and then <clears throat> uh, someone else took it over and started tweeting in my name. Uh, uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, and, and then a couple of uh, friends of mine, um, well, Lee and Jason Calcana said, they both said, hey, you should really, use Twitter to get your message out. Um, and also some somebody's tweeting in your name and they're saying crazy things. So I was like, I'll say crazy things in my name. Uh, <laughs> Did you have to pay them? No, no, they, 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 they um, I, I'm not sure who it was, but it was for some reason, at the, I don't know, I got my account back. And, um, and, and then I was just, I don't know, to some degree it's like uh, just sort of, I just started tweeting for fun, really. And my, my early tweets were quite crazy. Uh, as I was trying to explain, like it has the arc of insanity is is short uh, in that it's not very steep because it started off insane, <laughs> and so if it's still insane, it's you know it hasn't changed that much. Um, so um, yeah, and, and I don't know. It, it seemed it seemed kind of fun to you know. As, I think I've said this before. It's like you know some people use their hair to express myself. I use Twitter. If you're creating a company or if you're joining a company, uh, the most important thing is to, uh, attra is to attract great people. So either be with, join a group that's amazing, that you really respect, or if, you, if you're building a company, you've got to gather great people. I mean, all a company is, is a group of people that have gathered together to create a product or service. And so depending upon how talented and hardworking that group is, and the degree to which they are focused uh, cohesively, in, in a good direction, that will determine the success of the company. So do everything you can to, to gather great people uh, if, if you're creating a company. I'm really quite overcome uh, with emotion uh, on this day. It's, it's kind of hard to talk, frankly. Um, it's been 18 years working towards this goal, so it's, it's hard to believe that it's happened. Um, and we haven't quite yet docked at the space station, and of course we need to bring them back safely, and we need to repeat these, these missions, um, and have this be a regular occurrence. Um, so, it's still a lot of work to do, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's just incredible. When you had that third failure in a row, mm -hmm. did you think, I need to pack this in? Never. Why not? I don't ever give up. I mean, I'd have to be 
dead or completely incapacitated. If you want even more Elon Musk, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. You want to make something beautiful. I mean, you want to, to trigger whatever fundamental aesthetic algorithms are. Like, like in your brain, there's